So Gary, we've heard a lot of optimism today. We've heard it from startups, people from big companies, from the highest office in the land. But uh, the type of this session implies that you think not everything is figured out yet and that we may even be stuck. That, that is the word. What, what is the evidence that we're stuck? It seems like it's going so well. I think we actually saw some of it today. So I'm accustomed to going to conferences on AI in which everybody says, look at all the wonderful things that deep learning can do. And they never admit that there's anything wrong. But Russ uh, actually started the day with a great demonstration of three captioning problems that were great and then two that were not so great. Actually, a third I wish I had copied down with a, with a fist um, mistaken for an apple. Um, usually I have to give those because people don't actually um, give the counterexamples. And then Scott, I think, gave some, some great examples. Um, Geometric had worked on some similar things, showing how easy it is actually to break the um, deep learning systems of DeepMind in the Atari game context. So I was a little worried, actually, when Max put up the... Um, the demo of the breakout session and you know there's a little caption from DeepMind saying and now it like learns that you need to break through a wall. Well that's not really true. That's an abstraction that we superimpose on the system. But the reality is it's learning a bunch of regressions about pixels more or less. Um, and so it's, it is easy to break it. You change the, the light intensity. Um, we had a skiing game in my old company where we moved the trees around and the whole thing falls apart. So there are lots of ways in which Deep learning is really not the right tool when you need to get to abstraction. It's great for certain kinds of perceptual classification. Now, that doesn't mean that it's stuck, just, just it can't do those particular things. But I think the reality is it is stuck, that most of the field is obsessed right now with classification. We have some pretty good tools. Um, but classification is just one part of cognition. So cognition from the human perspective includes things like learning, memory, attention, some of which people are looking at a little bit, and things like language and reasoning where we don't really have tools right now and people aren't even that looking that much. So people in the field of deep learning are fond of talking about local minima. It's a technical problem that you have to deal with. Um, so you, know, you have a system that tries to find some solution. It gets to the best thing that's locally available. It doesn't get any further. I'm worried that the field is headed that way. So there, there is like incremental improvement each year in speech recognition, but that doesn't mean we're on the right path to artificial general intelligence. You know, artificial general intelligence has been around for 60, or artificial intelligence rather has been around for 60 years, but if you even had data to plot on artificial general intelligence, I would say that there's not so much of a slope there. Oh, okay. And so why, why has the field become preoccupied with classification and deep learning too, too much? Is it that people just don't listen to Gary Marcus enough? Definitely. <laughs> is, there, is there some kind of, I don't know, unhealthy mindset that has developed? Well, I think it's a lot of things. So, so one is, you know, the old joke about the drunk in the street lights looking for their keys, right? They keep looking under the same street light because that's where the keys are. The keys we have, I mean, that's where the light is, rather. I screwed up the joke, sorry. Um, rewind and edit that. Um, so people are looking where the street light is, and, you know, deep learning is a very powerful search light, and so people are tempted to, to look underneath it. Um, Part of it is because there's an antipathy in the field, sociological, that goes back 60 years between people building neural networks and people thinking about symbolic AI, which grows out of more like traditions like Bertrand Russell and trying to figure out logical foundations. And classical computing is just that. But there, there are people like Hinton who have spent a long time trying to show you don't need that kind of stuff. And the symbol manipulation people have never been too fond of the neural network people. And maybe what we need to do now is to build some kind of marriage between the two. But, you know, a typical grad student learns one tradition and not the other. I was at a NIPS conference on a panel with, I don't know, maybe Jan LeCun was there. And so the mother, pretty well-known people, the room was packed. It was bigger than this room, like twice as deep as is this room. And I said, how many people here have heard of Psych? Not how many you like it, but how many have actually heard of Psych? We could replicate that here. How many people know what Psych is? That's not a lot, and it's sort of similar to the reaction that I got at this NIPS workshop. Right? Psych is the most valiant effort anybody has ever made to put common sense in computable form for machines to use. And I would argue, I think most people would argue, it hasn't been that successful. There's no great commercial product that's come out of it. It's still incomplete. But what Lennett was trying to do was to have ways for machines to reason about everyday things. Like, you know, this is a microphone, and microphones are solid objects, and if I put it here, it might, um, you know, be stable. Something else is going to happen. Um, 
we don't have other systems that can do that. So it's fine to say, let it fail, but either you need to say, here's another way we're going to get to what he's doing, or here's what's wrong with what he did, or something. But most people in the field have never heard of it. This is a project that was 1,200 person years, working on, I think, one of the most central questions in AI, and the whole field of deep learning doesn't even know about it. And so if people don't know about it, don't know their history, that's a problem. Okay. And one concept you started to talk about recently is this, the idea that AI systems need to have more innate capabilities. And you recently spent two hours debating your longtime friend and sparring partner, Jan LeCun, at AYU. I'm sure most people in this room have watched all two hours of that debate. But just in case... You really should. It's worth it. Just, you can find it on YouTube. I, I have watched all two hours, and it was great. Just in case there are people here that haven't seen it, can, can you summarize the discussion you were having and, and, and the point you were trying to make? So, I mean, the, the question is the old nature-nurture debate. And the first thing I would say is it's not nature versus nurture. Anybody who's really thought about this realizes that nature and nurture work together. Um, we transpose that old debate about the roles of nature and nurture into AI and ask the same question. So, um, you know, the John Locke position is you can learn everything from the data. And the Plato version or the Liz Spelke or Noam Chomsky version or my version is you need some strong starting points in order to be able to learn what you need to learn. If you don't have those strong uh, starting points, you might, for example, never actually abstract the notion of an object. And then you can't learn about relations between objects if you don't have a genuine relation of an object. And then you're left um, with, in playing breakout the way Scott showed you. If you don't really know what an object is and I changed the intensity of the pixels, you're kind of in trouble. So I argued that we need, I think, about 10 starting points, um, which were things like operations over variables, which is what computer programs are built out of, uh, tr transformational invariance, which is actually what Jan LeCun is most famous for, even though people don't talk about it that way, um, but knowing that objects in, in, um, can be in the same place. Uh, the single object can be in different places and it has the same shape. Um, so I had this list of 10, which you, you can see in the debate. And to my surprise, Jan didn't want to go on board for any of them, even the one that he had invented. He said, we don't need any of these things um, to be innate. Uh, but you know, my contention is if you look around at what's happened, and this was written, uh, or uh, this talk was given before DeepMind had its most recent paper, we might want to talk about that in a second. But my contention is if you look at the systems that work, people often build in innate stuff in the back door. It's still actually there doing a bunch of the work, and that you know, there's good reason to think biology has a lot of innateness. Half of our genome, or actually 99% of our genome is represented in the brain. Like a lot of what the genome is there for is to build those strong starting points. So why would you try to get rid of all of that um, when you're building your AI? I think there's, again, a sociological bias. People think it would be so cool if we had AI boiled down to four equations we could put on a T-shirt, like physics. That would be fantastic. But if you look at how biology works, it actually creates lots of systems. And we talked about Danny Kahneman earlier today. I mean, he's, one of his famous contributions is kind of system one and system two. That they're calibrated to different things. One of them is a reflexive system that behaves automatically, and the other tries to do something more like deliberation. They work on different principles. And to imagine you're just going to get one system that handles all of the breadth of cognition, not just the perceptual side, but all the reasoning side, I think that's silly. OK, and let's take the example of AlphaGo Zero. I mean, it seems like every other Sessional stage has mentioned it, so now we can do it. We might as well do it, too. <laughs> All right, so, so here's the thing. The, um, if I had gotten that article for peer review, I would have sent it back for revisions. What it says very forcefully in the abstract is that they have shown that it can do what it can do without human knowledge. And that's not really true. I mean, you might start with an analysis of who made it. But there's 17 authors. Ten of them made the previous world champion in Go, and one of them was a champion in Go. Like, there was a little human knowledge that went into how they chose their parameters, and if you look... It carefully in the, in the second half of the paper where they go through the methods, you can see something of what it is. So, well, actually, even before you get there, you will see that Monte Carlo tree search is built in. Well, Pinker and Chomsky and me, what have we been arguing for years is you have to have innate tree structures. And they had that in this model, but they didn't have it in the Atari game model. So it's innate to one model and not the other. It's no accident it's innate to a Go system. People have been putting Monte Carlo tree search into Go for 15 years. So of course they started there. That's human knowledge that went into the system. Then they realized that there are symmetries in the board. So you can rotate the board, you can reflect it. They had a custom sampler built into their Monte Carlo tree search that exploits that fact. That's human knowledge. Then they had stride lengths, if you know what convolution is, that are you know, designed to work for the board. If you change the stride length, it might not work as well. You go through, you know, there's lots of little parameters, how many steps they're going to look out, where probably there was actually some, some human tuning. What would have been really exciting would have been if they took some generic algorithm that didn't have Monte Carlo tree search 
built in, and it actually figured that out from looking at pixels. And we also had someone make a point earlier um, about it has the board, um, you know, abstracted. So there was actually a lot of human knowledge. So it's a great piece of engineering. Um, you know, it's, it's much more efficient than before and so forth. But it does not actually show you don't need human knowledge. It just kind of buries it in the back. Okay. And th all those features you mentioned that you kind of encode human knowledge or, or particular approaches into AlphaGo Zero, I mean, are those examples of innate characteristics that we could Well, so Monte Carlo Tree Search, I think, comes closest to one that I deeply care about. Um, I mean, that's saying that you have the ability abstractly to represent compositional representations, which a standard multi-layer perceptron doesn't. It's just a bundle of features. And that you have some structure about how you're going to represent those features. And I think a lot of innateness ultimately is going to be about how representations are packaged and, and how they're structured in advance. Um, another thing I had on my list of 10 that I argued with Jan was cost-benefit um, analysis, and of course the system does that. Um, it doesn't do some of the other things I talked about, like understanding the affordance of objects, because they're not really relevant there. Oh, I left out one other thing about AlphaGo, I'm sorry, um, AlphaGo Zero, um, which is there's also no control group there. So what you really want to know, if you think you have putatively a system that can learn without human knowledge, is what can it learn? What's the scope of what it can learn? What are the kinds of problems that it actually works on? If it only works on one problem, I think it probably works on more than one, but it only works on one, you haven't really proven anything. But that's all, all they actually showed in the paper, was it could work for Go on a 19 by 19 board. They didn't show it would work on a 17 by 21 board. They didn't show it would work with chess. They didn't show it work with poker, they didn't show it work with natural language understanding and so forth. And so you haven't actually made the general claim. Okay. And so I think, you know, you're building a really good case here and there are some fun ways of doing it with the examples of the failure modes of these, uh, you know, cutting edge systems. But, um, you know, can we prove this another way by actually building something that goes, goes beyond these things? I mean, you previously founded a company called Geometric Intelligence. One of the things you talked about was being able to learn from sparser, smaller data set. I mean, can you... Yeah. I don't know, did you, were you able to do something that you think proved out what you're well, talking about here? I think we did part of what needs to be done in, in my last company. Um, and Scott's got, got an approach of his own. I think there are many ways of approaching the problem of sparse data. And I think the, the human beings probably solve this problem of sparse data, which is like, how do you figure something out if you don't have that much data? In many different ways. So in some domains, we probably have like innate mechanisms looking for a particular um, piece of data. So you see the ducklings, you know, they imprint on one piece of data because they're really looking for that particular thing. You can do experiments to see that there are constraints on it. So they won't implant on imprint on anything. If there's a good stimulus available, they'll choose it over another. But that's like a very sparse data kind of mechanism. And then, you know, language acquisition is a, another kind of sparse data uh, set of machinery. I think in my last company, we didn't focus specifically on neurosymbolic interface, and that's what I think the field really needs to do next more than anything else, is to take the power of symbolic representation that allows you to um, to generalize from the small amounts of data and represent abstract knowledge with the power of machine learning tools that can learn from broad sets of data. Okay. And, and during the quick fire round, you intentionally or unintentionally mentioned you were thinking about a new company. Is that what the new company is going to do? I mean, the, if I do a new company, we'll probably focus on that. I mean, really the question for me is, what is the best way for me to get the leverage that I want to work in this interface? I think there's enormous amounts of AI we can't really do because we can't integrate abstract knowledge with our machine learning. Okay. And another idea you've talked about recently is, is this concept of a CERN for AI. So what, what exactly would that be, and how would it be different to what the kind of research that's going on? So I had an op-ed in the New York Times about two or three months ago about this. And there were a couple of fundamental premises. One is that even with the large research uh, labs that we have in corporate uh, places, we may not have enough coordinated people working on certain problems. So, I mean, the primary thing that, that uh, companies work on is not necessarily in DeepMind or Facebook AI, but uh, as a whole is still advertising. Um, that's what the you know, largest amount of AI research actually goes to. And individual academic labs don't really do things that are that coordinated. So I do this, you do that, we don't, you know, we, maybe every year we meet at a conference. And there might be some pieces of getting to AGI that really need coordinated action. So maybe we need to replace Lenit Psych with something, you know, Psych 3.0 that is much more machine learned but still has an innate basis or something like that. We might need a lot of people working together on that. The question is what mechanisms? So that's one side of it. The other side, frankly, is do we want um, a large corporation, people had their different um, candidates, uh, to own all of the IP in AI, and maybe we don't. And so there, there might be some value in having the public work together on coordinated action to develop at least some of the um, IP uh, for AI. Okay. One characteristic of CERN, or in particular its most recent largest 
project, the Large Hadron Collider, is that it was structured around testing the standard model of particle physics. Do we have anything close to a standard model? We don't model have anything close in, yeah. in AI. There's actually a conference in a week or two about building a standard model of the mind, of the human mind. Um, but I, I would say that we're not that close, and I think one impediment to building this is there's not agreement about um, what the next steps uh, should be, and there, there are multiple approaches here. Um, I mean, I have my own views about a sort of space of possible models, and I think everything is kind of tucked away in one corner, and there's lots more to look at. But I, I, would, I would say that there isn't consensus. Okay. And I think we've got time for one last question here. So during your conversation with Jan earlier this month, he, he said at one point, I think he said this before, uh, that he would be happy if by the end of his career he could build a system with the common sense of a cat. So I think it was a rat, maybe. It was a, uh, he actually revised it. Oh, uh, yeah, he okay. says a rat, and then he switched it to cat. So he's, uh, he's <laughs> raised the bar. Uh, where is your bar? Like by the end of your career, wh where would you like to be? On that. I, I mean, I guess I kind of agree with him at some level. I think that common sense reasoning about everyday objects and the affordance of everyday objects, if we could nail that, I think it would be great. So a cat knows, you know, where it can jump. It's really good at integrating uh, a lot of navigation. It can do it in very different environments than it's ever um, seen before. I mean, I don't know all the cat experimental literature, but I'm pretty sure, you know, you could... <laughs> You can find that they're pretty versatile. Um, and in general, one of the biggest problems in AI right now is transfer. So you learn something in one context, one lighting value, and then you change the lighting value and it doesn't, doesn't work anymore. Um, I mean, that was a particular example with, with the, the um, breakout thing. It's not always true. But the general truth is we haven't solved transfer at all. And I think that animals can do a lot of transfer. If we could, we could match that, I think that that would be pretty exciting. Okay. Well, Gary, thanks for your time. That will be uh, – Thank you very much.